Welcome aboard. Today we're completing a stern conversion on a United States Air Force Air National Guard KC-135 Romeo Stratotanker, about 200 nautical miles southeast of the Strait of Hormuz, over the northwest corner of the Gulf of Oman. And today I'm proud to say that I've got a special guest in the aft cockpit, no Ewo, we kicked him out. It's just uh, my dad. <laughs> hey dad, welcome aboard. For those of you who don't know, my dad's name is Steve. His call sign in the United States Air Force is Lark 69. And he retired from the United States Air Force after 20 years of service and flew for American Airlines for about 23 years. In the Air Force, he started off flying the KC-135 Stratotanker for about 4,000 hours at a Wordsmith Air Force Base, which is near Oscoda, Michigan. Later, he flew the WC-135 for about 3,000 hours out of McClellan Air Force Base in Sacramento, California, and then flew the KC-10 for about 2,000 hours out of March Air Force Base near Riverside, California for a combined flight time in the Air Force for about 9,000 hours in big airplanes. Later on, he flew for American Airlines. He started off as a flight engineer in the 727 out of Dallas-Fort Worth. Then he moved to the right seat in the MD-80 out of Dallas as well. He later on moved on to the right seat in the 757 and the 767, flying out of Chicago, mostly, and a little bit out of Miami, before he moved to the left seat in the MD-80, based out of Dallas, where he flew for about 15,000 hours total for American Airlines. So 15 plus 9, 24,000 hours of total flight time in large, multi-engine, multi-pilot aircraft. Okay, we've been cleared for contact. I'm pushing it up, the right, left, got it. Okay, push it up now, make that good U shape. Get it all trimmed up, turn the hot down. All right, looking good. So without further ado, Dad, uh, glad to have you. The reason why I asked you to come on today is because we've got uh, quite a few questions from the people that watch the jams. And a lot of them are technique questions that refer to specifically to uh, people that fly tankers and big airplanes. So I wanted to ask you the questions that we normally get and see if you had anything to say. So here he is. Here's my dad. Hi, Brendan. Glad to be on board today and hope I can uh, help with any questions that you or your, uh, or your jammers might have. All right, cool. So the first question I have for you, Dad, is uh, do you get any kind of special training on tanker pilot considerations a lot of times I get asked, like, hey, does the tanker pilot say I'm going into a turn? Um, I say sometimes he does, sometimes he doesn't. It's kind of inconsistent. And sometimes when we're trying to join on tankers, uh, tanker pilots, some of them will have a lot of situational awareness and will make a conversion pretty easy for the fighter joining on them. But other times it turns into quite a fiasco. So do you guys get any kind of specific training on how to be a tanker pilot after you're qualified to fly the airplane? Or is most of that just kind of on the job training? Before you answer that question, though, we had some fuel streaming down the right side of the canopy, so I turned the bleed air knob to the right off position, trying to stop the ECS from mixing fuel and air in the cockpit, making it tough to breathe and hard to see. Well, you do get uh, specific training. At the, in my case, it was at Castle Air Force Base in California, but a lot of it is OJT, so to speak, because no matter how you want to write the manual, there's always uh, special uh, considerations, things which you can't you know, prescribe is what you're supposed to do. So you have to kind of figure it out as you go along. So there's a lot of this training which is prescribed, which you learn in school. They tell you this is what you should do. And however, once you get out there and start doing the job, you realize that not all situations can be covered with a manual. So you have to uh, wing it, so to speak, and do whatever you can to get the job done and be as safe as you possibly can. So you wing it. <laughs> I like that, that's good. On the same kind of line of thinking, do you fly the tanker any differently when there's a receiver in contact? I mean, I'm wondering like specifically when you turn the aircraft, if you've got any kind of different limits angle of bank limits, airspeed limits, things like that, when there's a receiver uh, in contact, or is it just basically the same same kind of thing? I mean, kind of talk me through, like, what are you thinking when you've got a jet in pre-contact behind you, then he moves up into contact, and now the tanker needs to go into turn. Can you talk through that a little bit? Sure. There are uh, several considerations, uh, the first of which is on the KC-135 and the KC-10, you have a boom operator in the back of the airplane watching the receiver and giving him verbal instructions if he needs it. So a lot of it, it comes from the boom operator's perception of uh, the receiver pilot. Is this guy stable? Is he unstable? Is he real, uh, what we call uh, fast on the throttle, or is he slow and easy? And a lot of that will then prescribe how the pilot's going to react 
which will be a little bit different if he knows that the receiver pilot is, uh, is bouncing around a lot and requires verbal coaching from the boom operator or not. All right, that's interesting. So along those same lines, I never really thought about it, but how do you communicate with the boom operator? Because as a growler in contact, pre-contact, whatever joint on the tanker, I'm up a tactical frequency where I'm talking to my wingman if I have one. I'm up the primary boom frequency where I can talk to the boom operator. And I know the pilot's also monitoring that frequency because every now and then I'll talk to the pilot. Um, but how do you communicate with the boom operator? Do you have a separate radio or how exactly does that work? Well, we actually have an onboard uh, interphone which connects all of the uh, crew members station and the pilot can select whether he wants to talk on the radio or through the interphone. So if you're talking through the interphone, You'd be talking to the boom operator. If he's talking to the radio, then he would uh, be also talking to the receiver pilot and anybody else who's on that frequency. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. You talk about talking to a boom operator, you know, if a pilot's quick on the throttles, if a pilot's doing something kind of weird, but have you ever had a situation where you've been unable to give gas to another aircraft, specifically because of the technique, maybe the poor technique of the receiving aircraft? Well, it is quite rare, but it has happened where through the observation of the boom operator, uh, we'd say that this guy is too unstable and we really can't uh, put the uh, the boom in the receptacle. And uh, they've had to tell him that they have to divert. And if the receiver pilot is just way too erratic or gets unsafe, then this procedure in the uh, tanker we would call a breakaway which is sort of an emergency procedure where the, where the tanker pilot pushes up the throttles and initiates a climb up to the top of your block altitude and the receiver then pulls back his throttles and pushes down to the bottom of his block altitude and to get the quickest separation that you can in the shortest period of time. Yeah, it's interesting because we always train to an emergency tanker breakaway and frankly I've never seen it, but in that case we just go idle boards and you try to leave the uh, the drogue where we found it so that when the probe detaches from the drogue, the, the drogue won't impact the radome of the aircraft. Cool. Along the lines of talking to a boom operator, can you tell me how many people generally are in that tanker? I mean, a lot of times I'll talk to the boom operator. Or, yeah, obviously, there's two pilots in the front seat. But are there any missions? I don't know if it varies from a 135 to a KC-10 or even a, a WC-135. How many pilots are in that airplane? Is there anybody else besides the pilots and the boom operator? Or is it just three people? Or do you ever do missions with a lot more people? How does that work? Well, the minimum crew on the uh, KC-135 was uh, two pilots and a navigator, and then you would have the boom operator in the back. On the KC-10 aircraft, you would have two pilots. You had a flight engineer and a boom operator. You did not have a navigator. The KC-10 had uh, multiple sets of inertial navigation systems, so the uh, navigator was a bit redundant, but we did have a, uh, a flight engineer on board the aircraft since it was a military version of a civilian aircraft, which was designed to have a flight engineer station. And as far as uh, additional crew members to that, that's all based on uh, mission requirements. Uh, long, long flights, you would have to augment the crews with additional pilots and flight engineers as required. Thinking about it, I mean, how long is the longest you've ever flew a more or less a continuous mission? I mean, you talk about you could have multiple multiple pilots in the airplane if you're flying a very long distance. How far have you flown? I mean, how long have you had the aircraft airborne before you finally just had to call it quits, I guess? Well, thinking back, the longest mission I believe that I ever flew was uh, 21 hours. And that was from uh, the west coast of California all the way to uh, Perth in West Australia. And it was nonstop. And we had to have uh, two air refuelings to get there, one off the coast of uh, California and one off the coast of Guam, take on enough gas to continue on to uh, Perth. It was uh, certainly my longest uh, mission ever. And how many pilots did you have on the airplane when you flew that mission? On uh, that particular flight, we had uh, four pilots on that aircraft, so we basically had two complete crews and we would swap out about every 12 hours. That's crazy. I mean, thinking about it, the longest mission I ever flew was coming home from deployment where we flew from Madrona, Spain to Bangor, Maine, behind two KC-135s and dry suits over the Atlantic. And we refueled, well, we, there was five of us at the time. 
Um, but we had to go and actually get into contact 12 times in that sortie uh, behind the tankers, and that was that was one hell of a mission. But to hear that you stay airborne for 21 hours and only tank twice is pretty impressive. We didn't have those kind of legs and that kind of fuel capacity in the growler. One last question I wonder about, and my viewers have always asked me too, and I don't know the answer, frankly. So when you are offloading gas, and I know it's a little bit different for a growler or a fighter that's only taken like, hey, maybe 10, 12, 13,000 pounds, something like that. Are you exercising any kind of considerations in the cockpit to, to maintain your aircraft at a constant speed? Because, I mean, once you're giving gas, your aircraft's getting lighter. If you had a constant throttle setting, your aircraft would increase in speed. So are you slowly pulling back on the throttles to maintain kind of a stable airspeed for, for me or any other receiver? Or do you just kind of let it slowly speed up over time? Now, I know it's a little bit different for a fighter as opposed to like a B-52, C-17, something like that, a big aircraft that's going to take potentially 60, 70, 80,000 pounds of gas, where that difference could be a lot more than what you see in a growler. But are you touching the throttles or are you just kind of letting it play out over time? Well, again, that's a good point, and a lot of it depends on who the receiver is. In training, you learn that you have a manual that tells you what the optimum uh, refueling speed should be for basically every airplane that you're going to refuel. Most of the pilots, though, will tell you that they would rather have you just uh, leave the throttles alone and let the airspeed build up rather than you keep pulling back on the throttles to try and basically slow down while he's pushing up the throttles trying to speed up but you still have a range of usually about 20 knots or so so they don't like you uh, jockeying all over the sky to try and maintain a constant speed but as long as you keep it within about about 20 knots of what the optimum airspeed is most of the receiver pilots are always very happy with that Okay, cool. So one last question for you. I'm obviously in the Navy. You're in the Air Force, and Mom is also retired Air Force. So at the end of the day, are we an Air Force family or are we a Navy family? <laughs> what do you think? I have my own opinion on that. Well, I always thought the, the blue uniform with the silver wings looked a lot better than the uh, gold wings on a white uniform. <laughs> so <laughs> you, have, you have my opinion on that. But aviation is aviation. You know, as long as uh, you're in the cockpit and you're up there flying, it almost doesn't matter what, what color your wings are or your uniform are. It's all good. All right, we've been cleared to disconnect. I'm just going to drift app and be careful to leave the drogue just where I found it. Well, I'll tell you, uh, uh, even Air Force pilots need uh, heroes, too. So you can fly Navy, and I appreciate you coming on board today. Uh, thanks for giving the viewers uh, an idea of what it is that's going on here from a different perspective, which is kind of neat. Uh, and more importantly, thanks for coming on and just spending a little bit of time with me today. I really appreciate it. Hey, wait. Let's see what this button does. Ah! <laughs> yeah, don't, don't, don't touch that. All right, all right. Easy, easy. Well, guys, if you enjoyed the jam today, please like, leave a comment, and subscribe. You can even buy me and my dad a beer. The details are in the description. Thank you for your continued support for this channel. Welcome aboard Growler Jams. You better quit touching stuff before mom finds out. She's going to be upset. I won't tell her.